All right, everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the inaugural uh, episode of the Commonwealth Corner. Uh, it's a new podcast brought to you by the Capital Tribunal and La Internationale. Uh, I'm one half of your host, Ryan. And I'm the other half, Julian. And this podcast is really going to aim to give a Commonwealth perspective on a lot of things going on in Canadian politics. And also, it's going to try and explain um, Commonwealth politics and give you an idea of what's happening outside the world of just, you know, American politics. Because I understand sometimes it gets in a loop where you're, you know, you're not focused on what's happening in the UK or Australia because there's so much happening in America constantly. So I guess, first of all, you kind of... We're going to go into a lot of topics with the podcast and to understand them, you need to have a base information of, I call them the three main divisions of the Commonwealth. Of course, there's a lot of Commonwealth countries uh, officially and unofficially, but there's, I guess, four major company, uh, sorry, uh, countries that really, um, cling on to the that that's a specific culture that they all share um and those four countries are i believe canada uh, the uk australia and new zealand what we're going to be doing is we're going to for the first episode be explaining canada um kind of for half the episode we're going to give you a little one-on-one just so you can kind of fully understand the topics we're going to be talking about and, and you know uh, maybe coming months, however long this podcast lasts. Next week, we'll be talking about the UK. Hopefully, we can get uh, some people from the UK in here to help us explain it. That would be awesome because there's only a certain amount that me and Julian uh, do know from observing it from afar, but actually living in it, you get a deeper understanding. Then the, mm-hmm. yes. Uh, And the third week is just going to be Australia and New Zealand. We're going to do it into one in one episode because a lot of their politics are very linked because they're so close to each other and they're so um, intertwined. Um, And they use similar systems as well. Uh, So I guess to I'll pass the floor to Julian to start it off. We're going to first explain how Canadian politics works. Yep. So Canadian politics and something very important about Canada is that Canada is a federation. So we have different levels of government with the three being the federal, provincial and municipal. Although you also would sometimes have regional municipalities. So groups of cities that band together and on top of their own city governments, they have a multiple city government. And just these are often of, smaller cities that come just, together. Uh, sorry, Julian. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, I live in the Halifax Regional Municipality, and Julian lives in the Toronto Regional Municipality. Yep. So, yeah, so like a bunch of smaller cities, they come together, and together they would offer services like uh, ambulance, police services, firefighters. So, like, in Waterloo, you would have the Waterloo Regional Police, despite there being multiple cities and towns, not called Waterloo, and different ones. So, at the federal level, we have a bicameral legislature, so two houses. So, we obviously have the House of Commons, the elected one, and we also have a Senate that very few people know. And I wouldn't be surprised if most Canadians also don't know that we have a Senate. The Senate is also quite controversial in the fact that it, it is unelected and it's all appointed by the Prime Minister. Um, Prime Minister Trudeau has actually tried to only appoint independent senators as of late. And I think Harper, Prime Minister Harper barely appointed any senators during his term. Mm-hmm. Um, now, of course, the independent senators still tend to vote with Trudeau, 
And yes, I believe ninety four percent of the time they vote with Trudeau. Exactly. So if if the system works or not is kind of up in the air. But even I believe uh, as recently as twenty fifteen, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure about this. Thomas Mulcair, the leader of the NDP, was campaigning on a promise to, if not remove the Senate, like completely reform it. Um, which is uh, like to do that, you would need all ten provinces to agree, and it would be a huge. Yes, effort. constitutional amendments in Canada are just a mess because Canada doesn't really have a codified constitution, and the way you go by amending it is just extremely complicated. Yeah, like to quickly get into the constitution. Basically, we we have a thing called the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which was signed in 1982 by mm-hmm. Pierre Elliott Trudeau. And that is, like, I have one hanging on my wall. It's a short document that just explains everyone's fundamental freedoms. But that's not the whole Constitution. A lot of, I've heard a lot of even my teachers when I was growing up call it the Canadian Constitution, but it's only part of mm. it. What yeah. what the yeah what the Canadian Constitution is is um, currently it's that document and the Canadian Constitution Act in 1982 which is it's a part of but yeah. as you know every single law that was passed from 1867 to 1867 oh, oh, to rather 1982 which um, before uh, 1982 we did not control our constitution it was controlled by the united kingdom now it it was a bill in the british parliament so every time we had to amend it we essentially had to ask the british house of commons and get them to amend their bill for our constitution to be amended yes and as you can think as an independent country that is kind of awkward no matter how much We like the UK and we have the same queen, which, by the Mm -hmm. way, our queen, our queen is the same queen as the queen of the UK, but the queen of the UK is not also the queen of Canada. You know, she's like, it's not the same position. She holds two separate positions. Yes. Her title here in Canada is Her Majesty the Queen of Canada, not like the Her Majesty the Queen of the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand. It's just Her Majesty the Queen of Canada. Exactly. And to kind of uh, shuffle to what parliaments are, uh, I'm sure lots of people listening to us know what a parliament is, but just to quickly go over it, um, it essentially is, imagine if like the House of Representatives was the main governmental system. And the the party which has the most seats, that party's leader, becomes the leader of the country. It, it, it essentially it mixes the executive and the legislative branch a little bit. I mean, technically, the executive branch is the queen and the governor general, which is the governor general is just like a stand-in for the queen in Canada. Mm-hmm. But in practice, it, it is the prime minister uh, because he makes all the appointments, whether it be, you know, Supreme Court, Senate, et yep. cetera, et cetera. And if you've, like, looked at charts of the American governments compared to the Canadian governments, like, on at the very top above the legislat- legislative branch, judicial branch, and executive branch, on top in the U.S., I believe, is where they put the Constitution In Canada, that's where we put the governor general and the queen. Exactly. And um, so uh, I briefly mentioned on the party thing. So to, yeah, uh, basically the party with the most seats, not necessarily the majority of the seats in the house, but just the most becomes the government. Now, if they have the majority of the seats in the house, they are... uh, majority government which means they last a whole term four years however if they do not have a majority of the seats they become a minority government or they call in the uk a hung parliament 
that's the same thing. It just means that they can be voted out of government by the House at any time via a vote of no confidence, which just means if enough people say, no, we don't like this government, it triggers mm -hmm. another election. And yeah, and that's essentially a simplified way of putting it. And that's what normally happens. But if you dig down really deep, it's essentially based on the governor general asking the leader of a certain party to form their government, to, to form the government. And traditionally, the governor general would always ask the bigger party. And in the case of a minority parliament, it's always the governor general should always be taking the advice of the prime minister. So even if, say, Justin Trudeau was prime minister before, and for some reason, he, and we, in our hypothetical world, he loses the election, like he's no, no longer even the opposition party, basically, he would still have to go to the governor general and say, you should ask this person to form government. So everything's really based off of the governor general. Yeah, Everything is just oversimplified. Yeah, exactly. And there's actually a, kind of an interesting story because before 1926, the governor general did have power. Now it's just very much a formality. But before mm -hmm. that, it was like the governor general did have the option to overrule really anything they wanted to. And in 1926, uh, uh, William Leon Mackenzie King, who was the uh, prime minister on and off again from 1919 to 1948, mm -hmm. he found it too difficult to govern with a minority uh, government. So after, I think it was like six months, maybe pushing eight, he asked the governor general to trigger another election. And he said, well, if you are finding it too difficult, uh, I will ask the leader of the opposition, the former government. And yep, I that's remember what he that. did. Yeah, that's what he did. And there was pretty big outrage over that. And soon after the governor general said, all right, all right, I'll do another election. And soon after that, uh, Mackenzie King, like in writing, I believe put a bill for that stated that the governor general could not have that power anymore. And it, it ended up becoming law. Yep. And it's really most clear when you see the difference in where our governor generals are from nowadays compared to back then. Like back then, it would just be like very senior noble british folks nowadays they're always like notable canadians so right now we have julie payette who was an astronaut before we had david johnston uh we even i believe also had michelle jean adrian clarkson so nowadays it's all notable canadians back then it were it was really just british people so yeah, you can exactly. see the switch exactly and um so that kind of touches on Parliament a bit. Now, to get a little bit deeper, we're going to talk about the parties inside of Parliament. Because Canada, it really, it has, I, I would call it a two-party plus system. So that what that means is only two parties probably will ever assume the prime ministership. However, um, it is. There are several other parties which will hold a significant number of seats, which can dictate how the government is run. Mm -hmm. uh, so kind of to explain the parties, we're going to go uh, from the party with the most seats in parliament right now to the party with the least. Um, and we're going to start with the Liberal Party. I'm going to uh, explain it because full, you know, disclosure i am a member of that party uh, i'll try my best to be as unbiased as possible you know you're not going to hear me uh singing the praises of trudeau here but just to kind of explain it so the liberal party has always been the liberal party that's what it started out as it uh, was for, uh, founded by gordon brown 
back in you know the yeah mid like the two big parties right now are all like mergers of many the liberal party was a merger of le parti rouge in quebec and the clear grits but that was like well before confederation yeah exactly that and that gets a little bit deeper into canadian history which uh I won't explain for a significant reason, which is going to be very confusing to people. And I think you know the reason, but uh, we'll get into that at a later date. Mm -hmm. But all you need to know is the Liberal Party has always been the Liberal Party, at least in Canadian, like since 1967 history. Yeah, it's um, the oldest party in Canada. Exactly. Um, and the Communist Party of Canada is the second oldest party of Canada, which is a little mm -hmm. interesting. Which we have two of. <laughs> yes, we have the Communist Party and the Marxist-Leninist Party. And let me tell you, if you can ever find one of those debates, it's golden. Because no other parties get so mad at each other than those two. It's good shit. Um, but, okay, so the Liberal Party is pretty much... It's, it's been either a center or center-left party throughout the history. It kind of depends on who's running it. Currently, mm -hmm. Justin Trudeau is the leader. He's been the leader, uh, I want to say 2013, he became the leader. Uh, and then he became prime minister in 2015. Uh, but, like, for example, Paul Martin, who was the prime minister from 2003 to 2006, he uh, amplified more of the centrists, like, moved it more to the center. Trudeau is more center left. Um, it's it has been commonly referred to as the, and I'm quoting the natural governing party, uh, because it's been in power for a significant amount of Canadian history, especially during the 20th century, uh, when you had like decades that went by where you had mostly liberals, maybe a four year conservative thing, but they're very much. A, a powerhouse in Canadian politics, and they probably always will be. Um, and uh, they've been able, most of the most famous prime ministers that you have heard of have probably come from the party. Um, and that's just because the Liberal Party has always been uh, the more uh, progressive party than any of the conservatives in history, which is if you're paying it an American looking at Canada, a lot of people look at us as wow, is it's a very progressive place now. If it is or isn't, it's kind of up in the air. But I guess that's a bit about the liberals. If uh, Julian wants to touch on the official opposition in the parliament now. Yep. So the conservative party, I believe, is technically. Well, it's not the newest because now we have another party. But currently, the Conservative Party, out of all the main parties, it is essentially the oldest. It started all the way back with the Conservative Party in Ontario. I don't think they had a fancy name. And then, and I don't think there was a Quebec equivalent. Or was there? No. I, I think there was actually believe... equivalent. Yeah, it was Parti Bleu. Oh, yes, yes. Party Blue. Parti Rouge was the party that didn't want to come together and form confederation, form a country. Yes, and actually, um, there was also the anti-confederation party, which uh, ran. It was a significant force in Nova Scotia for a bit, which is kind of ironic now that the Maritimes are often the most loyalist provinces in Canada now. Mm -hmm. But I, I'll let you go on. Yep, so the Conservative Party, and I believe at one point in the 20th century, which for Americans might seem like a long time ago, like long into their political history in Canada, the 20th century is, is actually considered quite recent because America is definitely a lot older than Canada. Canada became a country in 1867. So the 20th century is quite recent. And in the 20th century, that's essentially for some reason, all the conservative parties renamed into the progressive conservative party. And as we go down, 
and the progressive conservatives were definitely a lot more progressive. They weren't like progressive progressive, but they were quite centrist. They were quite they, moderate on a lot of yeah, social issues. They were very moderate and like like Ryan said, how federally the liberals are like the governing party that will almost always govern. For a brief period, not brief period of time though, but in the mid 20th century here in Ontario, we essentially had the big blue machine and it was the progressive conservatives and they governed the province for decades. And it was essentially because how moderate they were. So they were able to garner a lot of support. But as we move on into the later 20th century, that's when the conservative party the or the progressive conservative party it really split and it was during the time of prime minister kim campbell the first female prime minister of canada when she had a minority government it only lasted a few months before another election was called and in that election she was absolutely devastated well the party was it was a catastrophe for the party they finished the election with only two seats and during that time, there was also a new party, the Reform Party Party of Canada, and that was really the conservative, conservative end of Canadian politics. Because, as you know, the progressive conservatives were quite moderate. the The Reform Party isn't really moderate, and it's definitely on the right of Canadian politics. So, Oddly as enough, we though, move on, yep. Oddly enough, though, I, I will just quickly add, they were very concerned with environmental issues, which is kind of weird to think of nowadays. Mm-hmm. But in almost every other aspect, they're like very right wing. Yep. So they are the quite right wing of the party. And then in 2005, I believe, well, in, well, in 2005, there was a merger. And it was essentially the Progressive Conservatives and the Reform Party coming back together to form the Conservative Party of Canada. So that's why the Conservative Party is one of the newest parties in Canada. And it was really a balance of the more moderate end and the more conservative end. And you can even see that divide today. So during the merger, Stephen Harper from the Reform and the more conservative end of the party became leader and then he was able to lead the country for around 10 years with some controversy such as when he had his minority government and got parliament prorogued i believe to avoid a vote of no confidence coming through and that was quite a hectic time and even today as we move on into the conservative leadership election you can still see the divide in the party, where it's Peter McKay, who was actually the leader of the Progressive Conservative Party during the time of the merger. And you have Aaron O'Toole, who is currently representing the more conservative end of the party. And if you look at Peter McKay, he is a red Tory, which is essentially a very moderate and socially progressive conservative. And then you have Aaron O'Toole who's on the more conservative end. And I believe his slogan, one of his slogans is unapo- unapologetically conservative. And That's he's true. also stirred some controversy through his other campaign saying, take Canada back, which many are comparing to Trumpist politics. So you can still see the divide go on today. Yeah, exactly. And... um to kind of move on there, next, the next party uh, we got to talk about is directly linked to some of the history of the Progressive Conservative Party, and that is Le Bloc Quebecois. Now, yeah. I, w- I will say those are your two main parties. Um, the Liberal Party currently has 157 seats in Parliament. The Conservatives have 121, and now we're dropping down to the Le Bloc Quebecois, which has only 32 seats. So there's a seat drop, but these next two parties we're going to talk about do have enough seats to um, change some of the policies in the Canadian Parliament, so they are worth touching upon. But, so, Le Bloc Quebecois started 
in uh, June 1991. And it was a splinter section of the progressive conservative government of Brian Mulroney. Uh, the, the actual history of why they split is a little bit too complicated to get in now. But to put it simply, there is an amendment to the Canadian Charter of Human Rights they very much disagreed with. And after a ruling didn't go their way, they decided the party did not really speak for Quebec anymore. So they uh, ju jumped out of it. Uh, the founder of the party is Lucien uh, Bouchard. He, the, and that first kind of era of the party was very much a Quebec separatist party. Uh, they really, they wanted Quebec to have their own uh, nation, their own country. Uh, and in the, I believe, 1994 referendum, when Quebecers actually got to vote on whether they should stay or should they go, as the clash put it, um, he was very adamantly uh, campaigning to leave, uh, where the Prime Minister Jean Chrétien was adamantly campaigning to stay. Uh, obviously, he was trying to keep his country together. Uh, and uh, in 1996, uh, Bouchard decided to leave the provincial party and he went on to, uh, oh, sorry, federal party. And he went on to provincial politics where he eventually became premier. But the, the next leader is one of the more, most um, important when talking about the Bloc Quebecois. That is Jill Doucette. He was leader from uh, 96 to 2011, which is a very long time. And through his time as a party leader, he very much formed a new version of the party that tried to separate itself from uh, the Conservative Party, becoming a, a bit more progressive and not focusing on conservative politics as much. However, uh, through his uh, every election, he they, they kept losing little bits, a little bit seats, till they got absolutely decimated in 2011 and dropped down to uh, only a handful of seats. I'm not sure the exact number right now, but I believe it was under 10, which is like nothing in a parliament of 338 people, especially when this party usually gets 30 to 40. Um, so after that, he decided to leave as leader. And they had quite a few leaders between 2011 to 2019 that kind of dropped in and dropped out and weren't really able to get much success until uh, 2019 when Yves Francois Blanchet became the leader of the party. Uh, who very much moved the party in a lot more uh, leftist approach. Uh, there are certain issues which uh, they are more right-wing, such as the Burqa ban, which they believe that we should respect um, Quebec's wishes. And, you know, if they want, if the provincial government wants to do that, they want to do it, and we shouldn't interfere with that. But for the most part, they align more with Trudeau's liberals than uh, Shears conservatives. And they were able to get a complete breakthrough on uh, the 2019 election and win, I think it was a plus like 27 seats or something from the last election, like a giant. Um, so they're very much a party on the rise and they're also very much a newer party uh, that has that has completely changed over the past ten years to uh, project a different uh, different politics than they did. Now I saved this one to, for Julian because I know he would want to explain it. The next party we're going to talk about is the New Democratic Party. Yep. So the New Democrats is Canada's party for this. To the not exactly furthest, but the most major party that's on the left, and it's mostly a social democrat and democratic socialist party, and it's one of the not exactly old, but also not that new. It was founded in 1961, and I believe 
by Tommy Douglas, who was once also premier. And the new Democrats and Tommy Douglas are most known really for bringing universal health care single payer into Canada. And because of that, in the early 2000s, on Canada's version of Best Canadian, Tommy Douglas won. So the New Democrats have always been that that party for pe- like left leaning people who don't really want to associate with the liberals, and they've never been too big of a thing. Like they aren't a small issue, but they are still a pretty important party, but not super important. And that's how they've always kind of been. But that all really changed, I believe, in around, I think it was the 2011 election. Correct, yes. Under Jack Layton. And Jack Layton was a very popular politician, very charismatic. And that's how he was able to go to victory with 103 seats, which is a really big number and the liberals actually became third party in that election mostly also because the liberals made a terrible decision in their leader and one of those big things was the liberals leader was quite involved with americans and in canada there isn't necessarily an anti-american sentiment but more so we're better than them so we don't want to be like them and there's also the sentiment of Canada should Canada is not American and Canada is not British. But back to the NDP, so under Jack Layton, the party did become the opposition party, which is very rare for the NDP. And it just goes to show the situations where the NDP does well. The NDP really only does well when the liberals are doing very weakly are performing very weak weekly and this was also the election where the bloc lost almost all of their seats and i did check that by the end of the 2011 election the bloc only held three seats and so that's the current they side even, they didn't have a official party seats. status then yes they did lose they did oh, lose God. a lot they went from i believe like 47 seats to three seats and the NDP went from, I believe, 37 seats to 103 seats. But unfortunately, Jack Layton did eventually pass away soon after the election. And in 2015, Tom Mulcair was leader of the party going into that election. So Thomas Mulcair, I believe, is a Quebecois politician. And that also goes to show how influential Quebec is. So like on the Supreme Court, I believe, a third, so three justices must be from Quebec. And Mulcair was also one of the first NDP MPs to come from Quebec. And the NDP went into this election as the party, thinking that they were the party to become prime minister hence why they had like their signs and their slogan was stop harper i still remember their orange stop signs there actually is still one in Halifax. like they left it up it's still there so yeah it was obviously a very interesting election but quebec also this time kind of really left mulcair behind left the ndp behind because in 2011, it was the NDP. It was Quebec that gave the NDP their seats. 59 out of the 75 Quebec seats went to the NDP. And that's a lot of seats. So in 2015, with this strong liberal party, the NDP just dropped and plummeted. And you can see stuff like that happen in Ontario, although projections have changed. In 2018, the NDP in provincial politics, Ontario provincial politics, were able to become the opposition party because the Liberal Party was incredibly unpopular that year. So then 2015 was really the first slump in the NDP. And I wouldn't really blame Mulcair. Like the NDP is essentially always the party that's going to be like that. Always going to be 
a not a big force as long as the liberals are doing well. So in 2015, they dropped, and I think, and it really wasn't that significant. I think he dropped from dropped to 44 seats. I'm not sure. I can't remember. Uh, then in 2019, they just kept on dropping, and under Jagmeet Singh, they went to 24 seats. And it was still considered like an accomplishment for some, because the NDP could have done a lot worse in that election. Yes, and just to quickly touch upon that, there it is a touchy subject uh, why the NDP under Jagmeet Singh pretty much lost all their seats in Quebec. Because uh, if you've been following Quebec news, you know that they just passed a bill banning um, public employees from wearing any religious attire. And of course, uh, Jagmeet Singh wears a turban as he is Sikh. Uh, and when he was campaigning, he there was a, a specific uh, racist thing said to him and all, all this. Uh, to the point where even in Halifax, uh, I one or two times helped out the NDP candidate just because he was a young guy and he was really trying. It was a safe liberal district. And even us uh, experienced like people saying, you know, I'll never vote for that Muslim and whatever, whatever, even though he's not one. But mm -hmm. it, it is a touchy subject. And it's still ongoing, and it just shows you that racism is still alive in Canada, and it exists firmly. Yep. So, so that's really essentially the NDP. In my opinion, it's always a party that's going to be quite a small force. And then they seem to be quite disappointed when they end up going back to it once the Liberals do well again. But I really wouldn't blame Jagmeet Singh, Tom Mulcair, or any of them for going down to small force, because it's not really their fault. Like, the NDP is just always that way. I agree with you. Um, I'm sorry, did you have anything more to say about the NDP? Uh, I believe, yes, the block as well. And this just goes to show how having how the NDP vote is also very well distributed across the country and that also leads to them having uh less representation despite winning more votes so i believe the bloc quebecois last election only won around eight percent of the vote yet they gain they have 32 seats the ndp around 16 percent of the vote yet they only have 24 seats the ndp actually won a million or a, a little bit under a million more votes than the Bloc Quebecois. Yep, the NDP has nearly, actually I think over double the number of votes than the Bloc Quebecois. I yet believe the, so. Then yet the Bloc has n close to double the amount of seats of the NDP. So it just goes to show how the Bloc's, uh, how, how the Bloc's votes are concentrated as obviously the Bloc only runs in Quebec. Exactly. Um, so to touch, there's one more party that holds seats in Parliament, and we're going to quickly touch on them, definitely not as much detail as the other ones, because this is a very minor party. It is the Green Party of Canada, um, formerly now led by Elizabeth May. Uh, she mm -hmm. stepped as leader after the election. But she's still the house leader, though. She so is. She, she still leads the party in the house. Actually, the current leader, I, I think, I don't want to say the name because I'm only half certain on who the current interim it's leader is. Joanne Roberts. That's it. She ran in the Halifax. I, I've met her, actually. She's very nice. Um, But I will, they're, they're not a lot like, their European counterparts, or even their American counterparts. The Green Party, is, it, it's very concerned with environmental issues, yes, but it has some uh, controversial um, opinions on, on things such as 
medical care. Like they, some of them believe more in natural medicine and even some conspiracy theorists to, I don't know if you remember mm-hmm. Julian, but back, I forget what government is, but Elizabeth May actually tabled legislation to look into the real cause of 9-11. Which, oh, that does, yeah, that does sound incredibly familiar. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's just, I mean, I'm sure Elizabeth May is a lovely lady, um, but the party very much was a cult of personality around her for a long time. But uh, she did do a lot for the party because before her, the Green Party was really a single issue party. She kind of changed that and they now are a party that has like a genuine platform surrounding many issues, although many of those issues may be quite controversial ones with their positions. Exactly. And she also, she is allowed in leadership debates and everything. And I just, I just find that a lot of the Canadian media kind of pipes her up as e- the equivalent to Trudeau or Cher or even sing when in reality they only hold three seats um which is what like under one percent of the parliament and as well that is their best showing ever um (laughs) because this this election they won a seat in fredericton when in previous they just had two seats both on bank i know victoria island which i mean yeah and I, and I remember the headlines when they won their second seat. It was like literally Green, Co- Green Party doubles their seats in government when it was when, really just an increase in one. Yeah, that's, that's hilarious. <laughs> but um, that's all the parties that have seats. But we are going to quickly touch on one more party because they are relevant. And that is the People's Party of Canada, which is very much a party which... Uh, fractioned off from the Conservative Party, I believe, in 2019. Yes, it is the very, very conservative end of the Conservative Party. Maxime Bernier is the leader, and he came in second in the leadership election following, uh, I believe it was Stephen Harper's resignation. So Andrew Scheer was kind of like the candidate that played both the conservative sides and the moderate sides, although he does lean a bit more to the conservative side with the social views. And Maxime Bernier was really the complete conservative side of the party. Yeah, actually, I, I agree with you. I will add that Bernier started out, especially when running it, as more of a libertarian person. But I, I found ever since the election of Donald Trump, he shifted more towards right-wing populism and especially in the 29 2019 election he firmly planted himself as more of a right-wing populist and that party is more of a right-wing populist party um to the point where there there was billboards all across the country of his face and a thing saying say no to mass immigration yes Apparently, it wasn't the party paying for it, though. So that was quite a controversial issue at the time. Yes, a very weird one as well. Yes, so Bernier in the 2019 election did not win any seats. Even with, uh, even in his own riding, he lost to the Conservative Party. He got rejected by his own constituents. Are they somewhat of a force... A very, 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 very minute force. They're bas- basically all they do is sometimes cost the conservative certain seats. Yes, yes, that did in fact happen in some seats. The PPC and conservatives together, if they, assuming all PPC voters would have voted for a conservative, they could have won some seats. Exactly. I think the range was only like five to ten. Mm-hmm. So it's not like. It lost them election the election, but it did cost them a little bit. Yeah. So I know that's a lot of information to uh, get all in one sitting, but that is 
a Canadian politics 101 type of thing. We didn't go into as much as we could have, but frankly, if we did, I I don't know if you would retain much of it. And we'd uh, be here for hours, hours oh, and hours. So long. There's a oh, lot to cover. Oh, so much. But we're going to pivot now because I'm sure you're both intrigued by Canadian politics, but you might want a little break now. So we're going to touch a bit on the American elections because that is a very topical thing happening right now. Yes. And um, especially Canadians know, exactly. every, know a lot about American politics, while Americans know close to nothing about Canadian politics. Besides Trudeau, that's it. Yes, uh, both Trudeaus. It, if they're going to know any prime minister, it will be either one of them, which I find kind of funny. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, so, you know, I'm, everyone knows who's running. I'm not going to give a one-on-one. You know what's happening. But, uh, Julian, was there anyone uh, in the Democratic race you 100% like supported or liked or anything like that? Well, obviously, as I am in the SP, most people would expect me to be a big Biden hater. But I am on what on the moderate end of the party. And really, my mindset going into this election is find someone that's able to win the swing states. Because for those on the very left, they they don't really see a difference between Trump and Biden. To them, it's just two senile old men, as my friend would say. But I, I can still say that like I would much rather have a Democrat than Trump. So I, yeah. I didn't really go in with like a preferred choice. I'm just willing to support a Democrat. Exactly. Uh, I I do agree with you. I I don't I don't love Biden, but mm-hmm. I think having four years of a decent to perhaps forgettable president would be better than another four years of Donald Trump. Um, yeah. It. It, it's just the cards that we've kind of been dealt with. And I don't, I don't believe some of the allegations of dementia and everything. I mostly it's ridiculous. Yeah. Mo- most of the evidence I've seen has either been clips that have been kind of cut up conveniently or, or his, his stutter acting out, which of course, as you get older, it starts to become less controllable. And, me and the thing is you can trust that Biden will likely seek advisors and people like that aides. While on the other hand, Trump will just be, you, you don't know what he's, he's just going to be, he, if Trump, he, he's already doing some very questionable things and you can trust that he, he will continue to do them. Unlike Biden, who would likely be seeking advisors and aides, people that at least know what they're doing. I kind of find it kind of ironic that Trump called himself the law and order president when if I'm putting the two together, I trust Biden a lot more to follow the law than I would ever trust mm-hmm. Donald Trump. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, there was no candidate even in the Democratic primary that I fully supported. I liked certain people and certain people's ideas like you know i i like some i love bernie's ideas i i liked bernie in 2016 of course i was a lot younger back then um and i have our revolution on my bookshelf however i i don't i don't love him uh, i just think he is a cool politician and he has some good views and i think he's done a net positive however i am a little bit concerned about some of the toxic toxicity in his fan base and why um, it was so much more present I found in Bernie's fan base than others. And that's not saying all of them were, I'm just, I'm just saying there were certain people in that movement, which concerned me. Um, I also liked some of Andrew Yang's ideas. I like the energy he brought forward. I, I wish he would have done without the whole math thing. I, I, as as kind of 
it just it, it promotes the wrong thing. But that's neither here nor there. That's that is a small thing. Um, I also liked you know some of the Pete Buttigieg's and Amy Klobuchar's I thought were intriguing as well. But there's no one really that I latched behind uh, in it. You know, I don't know about you if you if there are specific people you found interesting in the uh, primary. Well, for me, my focus is, was really just making sure that Trump would not be president and come next year. I, I, I don't. It's just sad to see how things which we would normally consider outrageous for a president to do are just like brushed off as like, oh, no, he just did something else again. Like, if you think if Obama did something like that, if Bush did something like that, people would be, things would be crazy. But we're just like moving on like it's perfectly normal. It's like we're used to ri- like ridiculous things happening. Well, exactly. And like, you don't even have to look that far. You just look anytime Joe Biden says anything that, you know, a little bit of a gaffe everywhere on the media. But, Donald Trump has said so many horrible things that it's just business as usual. You know, when he mocked George Floyd, that barely got any media coverage. But, you know, when Biden said the stupid comment about the black card thing that every every news organization was blasting that and everything. And it's just... Yeah, it's just like, it's just... It's very interesting to see the different standards and how much Trump has numbed the American populace, in fact, the entire world, to ridiculous things happening. Yeah, I agree. It's and actually, uh, interesting statistic: it, um, most it, people there, there was a poll a few weeks ago that polled everyone. Um, uh, it pulled a whole bunch of people in Canada and it asked them as well what their party membership was and in every single party people said they preferred Biden over Trump even the conservative party yes yes I have the results open right now everybody in Canada vast majority of people would prefer to have Trudeau over Trump even in Alberta, the most Trudeau-hating province would rather have him than Trump. It, it's, it just shows you can, Canada just, it's not really meant for Trump-style politics, and I don't know if it'll ever really latch on mm-hmm. to that. Just because it's, I've always found Canada has been more, I don't want to say accepting, but more of a gentler country, you know. Yeah. And it's also just that Canada is a more progressive country. We ha- we do support more left leaning policies. All parties support our universal healthcare system. All parties technically do support abortion. So Canada is generally a more progressive country compared to the U.S., and that is a large factor in explaining why there is so much dislike of donald trump in canada and with the moderate versus conservative divide in the conservative party it can even be seen in their support for trump 45 percent of conservatives support trudeau would rather have trudeau than trump while 31 percent would have rather have trump over trudeau compare that to the rest of the country where 76 percent would rather have trudeau over trump while 10% would rather have Trump. So you can still see the divide within the Conservative Party with their opinion with Trump. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think, like, even if you look over to the UK with Boris Johnson, I don't, I don't think Boris Johnson is really anywhere near Trump. I don't agree with him, but I, I find him a bit more respectable. You know, he does have very stupid scandals, but I don't think he is an inherently dangerous figure to the UK's democracy, which it just, it, I don't know. It shows how worrying this Trump figure is that 
you know, we we think, at least I think of him as akin to someone like Vladimir Putin who looks as elections as a game and how they can win a game, which, in my opinion, is not the correct way to look at them. Yeah, American politics is very different nowadays. And a very important thing the Democrats must do is do not underestimate Donald Trump because Donald Trump does politics differently than how politics has always been. So you have to be very careful going into it. Exactly. Now, um, we're getting close to the end of this episode now. Um, So I want to pivot a little bit and quickly touch on the Mount Rushmore of Canada, as I'm dubbing it. And what what this is, is, of course, you know what Mount Rushmore is. I, I want to, for me to say and for Julian to say what we think, who we think is the most um, impactful Canadian prime ministers. Uh, and hopefully we'll have a little bit different answers. So it just gives you kind of people to Google. Uh, to research if you want to know, you know, the history, you know, how Canada got to be Canada. So I, I do have my four picks. Uh, do you have them off the top of your head, Julian, or do you want me to go first? You can go first. I do. Ha- I wouldn't. I probably don't have like four, but I I do probably have like some like multiple, and then I could just say like which ones like my rankings for them. Perfect. All right. So, uh. The first person I'm going to start with, I'm kind of going to go in order of uh, oldest to newest. Um, the first person I'm going to start with is Wilfred Laurier, which is kind of con- controversial because I'm not going with the founder of Canada, which was Sir John A. Macdonald. But the reason why I'm not going with Sir John A. Macdonald is because I think... Canada became Canada and Laurier's term, which was, I believe, 96 to 11. Uh, that's 1896 to 1911. But uh, a lot of the things we think of that define us and everything, I believe, came up to fruition in Laurier's term. And he, he really founded the modern Canada. Now, it can never be taken away from Sir James, John A. Macdonald that he is the one that like physically founded it and he built the first railroad and he connected the country. But I don't think his longstanding impact aside from Indian relations, which is a whole nother topic that we're not going to open that today. We will eventually. Um, it didn't have as much impact on the as Laurier's term. Anyway, moving on now, I'm going to go with, uh, someone we mentioned previously in the podcast, which is uh, William Leon Mackenzie King. Mackenzie King uh, served as prime minister from uh, on and off from 1919 to 1948. He um, he had four years in 1930 to 1934 where he was not prime minister. Um, but he stayed on as a leader of the party as well. There was a a year, um, two times, so like one year in the beginning of like his term and one year in the later 1920s where he wasn't prime minister. But essentially, his leadership, the uh, it, it brought Canada into becoming its own independent nation. As I talked about, he completely cut like um, the UK's power to Canada. Um, as well, he got us through World War II. He, um, he reinvigorating, invigorated our economy and promoted labor practices. He, he is very much a, iconic figure in Canada. He is on our $50 bill. Next person I'm going to touch on is going to be Lester B. Pearson, who is currently in my profile picture, and that might date this a little bit, but that's all right. 
Um, he, he has a long resume, and I really recommend looking it up. But inside of just inside of Canadian politics, I mean, he did. His government is the one that implemented universal health care across Canada. Of course, Tommy Douglas did it in Saskatchewan, but uh, him working with Tommy Douglas did it across the whole country. His government also um, uh, came up with the Canadian flag that we all know and love. That was during his government as well, which is a very interesting, you know, part where you had the leader of the opposition calling the new flag a communist flag, which is kind of funny. Um, but as well, things like uh, de or criminalizing a capital punishment and decriminalizing homosexuality were key things in his term as well. He really deserves a Wikipedia read because he did phenomenal things for both the country and the world as during the Suez Canal crisis, he came up with the idea of the UN peacekeepers, the blue helmets. That's a really his invention. The last person I'm gonna, gonna put on is Pierre Elliott Trudeau. He served as prime minister from 68 to 84 with a one year break in 1979. Actually, it was more like eight months, but that's neither here nor there. But he, he uh, like Canadian Charter of Human Rights, is the biggest thing he's done. Uh, but there was also so much during his term, it's hard to talk about them all. And Justin Trudeau, he is a great politician on his own, but he is bolstered a bit by, or at least he was when he started by his father's legacy. Uh, he is very fondly remembered in the east. Uh, eastern part of Canada, but in the western part of Canada, he is less fondly uh, remembered because a lot of the east-west divide came during his prime ministership, and he really shaped modern Canada. Like when you think of Canada as it is now, it really draws back to his prime ministership. With that, I'll end my Mount Rushmore. If Julian wants to jump in now, all right. So yes, I. I like always, am a fence sitter. I can't make up my mind on everything. So instead, I came up with four tiers, so I'll make it quick. So unlike Ryan, I put my number one as Pierre Trudeau, as Pierre Trudeau was really the final push in making Canada very independent. Although if Canada does ever one day become a republic, the prime minister who does that will obviously be finally considered the final push in making Canada independent. Then we have Wilfred Laurier. For me, I put him number two. Despite Wilfred Laurier being quite racist, he did do a lot in building Canada into the country we know as today, like Ryan said. My third tier is the one where I really get many people in. So I have Sir Johnny McDonald, or what's who some people call the SJAM, for because it's really just after schools and that's how people shorten in the names uh sir georges etienne cartier and george brown although not all although only one of them sir johnny mcdonald was actually prime minister these three people sir johnny mcdonald from the conservative party in ontario sir georges etienne cartier from the parti bleu the conservative counterpart in quebec or lower canada at the time and George Brown, the clear grits liberals in Ontario, they were really the three people that banded together, formed the coalition, and said, let's build this country. And then my fourth tier is w William Leo Mackenzie, Robert Borden, and Lester B. Pearson. Because all of these people, they, both William Leo Mackenzie and Robert Borden, I believe, were wartime prime ministers in both world wars. And Lester B. Pearson, like Ryan said, is the prime minister who brought in the uh, UN peacekeepers, the new flag, and many other things. And he even won a no the Nobel Peace Prize for that. And another interesting thing about Lester B. Pearson and the flag is that the main reason why he decided that Canada needs a new flag is when the U when is when the Canadian troops 
or their 40 Suez crisis, they would see the Union Jack on Canada's old flag, and they would and there was a huge distrust created. So that's that's what really prompted Lester B. Pearson to decide to create an independent flag free from the UK. And the, in fact, the flag that he wanted to make was is actually quite different than the one that we have today. And the one he wanted had three maple leaves in the middle, and the bars on both sides were quite shorter, and they were blue. But I believe it... I can't remember exactly who, but the current flag is based off of the Royal Military College's flag. So those are... That's my Mount Rushmore for Canada. And if anybody does want to do research, further research into these people in Canadian history, I would highly suggest checking out Historica Canada's content as they produce Heritage Minutes on you, and they, those are uploaded onto YouTube. And they also run the Canadian Encyclopedia, which is a website that covers, it's like Wikipedia for Canada. Yeah, ex uh, exactly. I can't recommend here enough. So, uh, I hope you enjoyed our first podcast. Um, to kind of lead us out, first, uh, every episode, we're going to recommend a song from a Commonwealth uh, country for you to look up. And as we covered Canada today, I can only think uh, of to recommend one of the most Canadian songs, which is Bob Cajun by the Tragically Hip. Which, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's just any Canadian knows it and they'll be able to sing along to it. Yep, it's a very, it's a song that's very tied a lot into Canadian culture. Exactly. Um, all right, so next week we're going to focus on the United Kingdom, um, and hopefully we'll get some people from the United Kingdom in here to help us along with this discussion. I have been yep. Ryan. And I'm still Julian. And we thank you for being in the Commonwealth Corner. <laughs>